All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this Founder Institute uh, special FI50 alumni panel. Today, we're going to be featuring uh, three founders of fast growing Founder Institute portfolio startups. Uh, my name is Dustin Betts. I'm going to be uh, your host for today. I'm a community manager at the Founder Institute. I also sort of play a role as a grad uh, team liaison between our HQ marketing team and our grad success team. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. For those who are not familiar with Founder Institute, we are the world's largest pre-seed startup accelerator. Uh, we've now helped launch over 6,000 portfolio companies across more than 200 cities all around the world. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Founder Institute, we are currently enrolling for uh, pre-seed accelerator programs on all six continents. And you can see that full list of enrolling uh, accelerator programs at fi.co slash enrolling. Uh, so the agenda for today's uh, event is basically I'm going to very briefly introduce the three featured FI alumni on the panel today, uh, and then we're going to dive straight into to the Q&A. So I have a couple of questions that I've prepared to ask them, but uh, we really encourage you to ask questions. That's sort of the, the, the reason that we host these events is for you all in the audience to have a chance to ask our alumni uh, your own questions. So don't be shy. At any point uh, that questions pop into your head, whether it's for the whole panel or addressed to just one uh, specific alumni here on the panel, um, yeah, please feel free to drop them in. And uh, my trusty producer, who's helping in the background, Felicia Terrell, will help surface the questions and, and bring them to our attention so that we can uh, ask the panel. Uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty much, uh, we're gonna just focus on, on Q&A and hopefully get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, so without further ado, I'm just gonna kick it off here and uh, introduce each of our three panelists in turn, and then we'll, We'll move to Q&A. So uh, our, our first featured panelist is Hanan Shaheen. Uh, she is an FI Jordan alumni and the founder of Bloom. Bloom is a try before you buy fashion e-commerce platform where customers can try on clothes before having to make their final purchasing decision and deciding to pay. And um, Bloom announced receiving pre-seed funding in October of 2021. Uh, Hanan, thanks so much for, for joining. You wanna um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your company by way of introduction? Hello, Dustin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk again about Founder Institute because it, it did change my life. Um, and I, I want to give back. <laughs> um, I had a startup before my, my, my startup Bloom and I suffered a lot. Uh, and I actually got to know about the program while I was volunteering with Founder Institute Jordan to recruit founders. Um, and at some point I was talking about the program. I closed the phone and I thought, you know what, this is exactly what I want. So I closed my first startup because it was not scalable and decided to start with the second one, which is Bloom. Um, and yeah, so this is initially the story. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here, Hanan. And uh, yeah, uh, so everybody who has questions about Bloom as we as we go, definitely um, don't be shy. Yeah, put them in the chat um, for us to ask. Uh, our second panelist I, I want to introduce next is Michael Collins. Uh, he is an FI Toronto alumni and the founder of Periculum. Uh, Periculum uses alternative data to provide credit assessments, so different from your big three um, credit uh, agencies, and this is for, for borrowers largely in underserved markets, um, and so those alternative um, credit assessments allow lenders and financial institutions to lower their risk of lending and, and lend to, to these underserved markets. Um, Periculum announced a $620,000 pre-seed funding round in October of 2021. Uh, welcome, Michael Collins. Please uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about yourself or, or your company. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, Michael Collins, um, Nigerian born, raised, um, you know, I have a background in banking, and you know, where, that's where I actually started to discover the need that we're, of what we're solving, and founded a company in 2019, and in uh, 2020, uh, late 2020, I uh, joined the Founder Institute program, which uh, accelerated our company, our business, and I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to talk more about that, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here, Michael. Uh, yeah, excited, and yeah, people who have questions about Paracool, FinTech for Michael, yeah, 
drop them in the chat and, uh, and we'll get to them next. Uh, our last but not least is our third panelist I want to introduce is Nana Prempe. He is an FI Ghana alumni and the founder of Grow For Me. Grow For Me is a crowdfunding platform that helps small and shareholder farmers to scale up their growing operations. And in October of last year, Grow For Me was selected by Google Black Founders Fund to receive non-dilutive capital. Uh, welcome, Nana. Please tell us uh, yeah, a little bit more about yourself and, and about Grow For Me. Hey, thanks so much for having me here. My name is Nana. I'm CEO and co-founder of Grow For Me, and uh, we started our company um, about two years ago officially. Uh, prior to that, we had uh, experimented with farmer input financing and realized that there's a great opportunity in, in agriculture in Africa. And as we went deeper, we realized that there was a need to provide a ready market. So our company currently spends a lot of time raising capital to provide a ready market for farmers. And just last week, we also incorporated in Kenya and Nigeria. So we are growing gradually and I'm excited to be here. Fauna Institute made it possible for my co-founders to come to speed with what it took to build a tech company. Um, this is my second company and I was so happy that we went through it, helped us in our fundraising process and we, we, we are happy with where we are now. Awesome. Yeah. Interesting theme. Yeah. Between uh, you, Nana, and, and Hanan, who both, um, this is your second startup, uh, and that's the one where, where you joined Founder Institute. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Nana, for, for being here. People who have questions about crowdfunding, about uh, smaller scale agriculture. Yeah. For Nana, definitely drop those questions in the chat. Yeah. Just can't emphasize that enough. The, the purpose of this event is really to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, so, please uh, don't be shy. Yeah, really quickly, I wanna highlight too that we've done these uh, uh, alumni panels before, but this is a special one. It's our FI50 alumni panel. So if people haven't seen our FI50 report, you can go and check it out. It's at our website, fi.co slash 50. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where we're kind of pulling these three founders from here. It's a report on 50 of the fastest growing companies from across Founder Institute's global portfolio. And yeah, since we released that FI50 report in Q4 of last year, we've uh, gone on to release a couple regional ones. So we have one that's highlighting just companies from LATAM. And then we have another one that's highlighting companies from all across Europe, Middle East and Africa, or EMEA, uh, FI50 report. So we're kind of regionalizing them now. But yeah, these three founders were featured all on the original one at fi.co slash 50, the global report. And um, yeah, we're super excited to, to have all three of you here to, um, to kind of uh, yeah, answer questions for everybody. So yeah, just uh, please drop questions in the chat. Felicia is going to help bring them to the surface. I'm going to kick it off right now with um, one question that I want to ask each of the panelists in turn, which is, uh, at what stage were you when you began the FI program? And what was the biggest reason why you decided to join the Founder Institute Accelerator at that time? Um, so let's just kind of go in, in order that I introduced you. If uh, Hanan, you want to speak to that first? Yes, so um, I was in, I think, less than even an idea. <laughs> um, all I wanted is to do a successful business that can actually grow, that is scalable. And I didn't really know how. Again, I had a business before. It was not scalable. I did not know it was not scalable. Uh, I just was, I was working hard. Um, I did succeed, but I don't think the amount of success that I got was equivalent to the hard work I did invest in and even the money. Um, so um, I decided to join Founder Institute with whatever idea I had, something I really like to do, uh, which is clothes. And it was the pandemic. We started in 2021. Um, and it was not easy to try on clothes uh, in the shops in Jordan. Uh, so my idea started with simply just um, uh, putting on uh, outlets, outlet apparel online. And during the program, it changed a lot. I pivoted around 11 times. <laughs> I'm the queen of pivots <laughs> um, because it was not a clear idea and that was fine. Um, I mean, this is the core of the program is that you and your idea grow together. Um, actually, I just pivoted lately <laughs> again, uh, because the more you understand the market, uh, the better your idea becomes. Um, so this is the level that I started with again, less than idea stage. Um, yeah. And what was the second question? Oh, it was, uh, 
yeah, and what was your biggest reason, I guess, for, for joining the Founders? You kind of alluded to, you know, having had one startup before, but uh, yeah, did you want to speak to that part? Yeah, I think I just saw that working hard is not good enough. I've always thought that if you just work hard, success will come to you. It just doesn't. <laughs> uh, you get burned out. This is what comes to you, but you might not succeed. So, yeah, this is the reason why. Yeah, Sue, so thanks so much for sharing that, Hanan. Yeah, if we had to distill like the, the value proposition of Founder Institute into one word, which is an exercise we did somewhat recently, we said a direction. And so we try to provide founders with um, a direction to, to navigate that startup journey. And so it sounds like that was kind of um, something that you got out of the program, uh, which is great. Uh, same question to, to you next, Michael. Um, at what stage were you at when you began the, the Founder Institute Accelerator in Toronto? And what was your um, biggest reason for um, deciding to join? Yeah, so um, I was a little bit further ahead in my life in, my, in the company's life cycle. Uh, I founded a company in June of 2019 and uh, joined FI. Um, I, I joined the 21 cohort, so that was like um, I think we started in November. And it, but we had um, you know the business idea that I came into FI with uh, evolved. And it reminds me of a Winston Churchill quote where he says to improve is to change and to perfect is to change often. And that's basically what Founder Institute helps you do is to help you to improve on what, you, what your idea is or what, um, what you think your product is to help you achieve that product market fit, which is, which is what every founder is trying to do. Um, and it helped me even to refocus kind of like what we're trying to, uh, like kind of like our target customer. And now we are now, we now have customers in Nigeria and Kenya where we, we have business and we have employees. Now we have about 14, 15 employees now in the company and we're growing and scaling rapidly. So, um, and the reason why I joined FI essentially was because I needed a direction like I, I had you know I, I knew what we're trying to the problem we're trying to solve but I, I didn't know how to do it really like um, you know so you know, joining FI I was able to be around the network of uh, mentors uh, the other you know cohort members and the difficulty of being in FI and kind of gives you a kind of um, almost a real world view of what it's like to, 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 to run a company. Um, that definitely helped me later on, which later in the year, we, we were able to generate revenue and then you know, move on from there. But yeah, so that's, that was, that's kind of like our story. Yeah, great. Uh, definitely feel like there's a lot of overlap um, between kind of the pivoting around uh, your your value proposition between yeah what you and Hanan also just said. Uh, so so that's great to hear. Uh, but same same question to, to you as well, Nana. At what stage were you um, when you began the program uh, in Ghana, and um, and what was your your biggest reason for deciding to to join the Founder Institute Accelerator? Yeah, thanks once again for the question. So um, my co-founders and I had tested idea. We had literally cycled from Accra to Nigeria on bamboo bicycles for five days and seen that there was a great opportunity to finance farmers and to provide inputs. Um, but we got to a point where we were, about, we were about to start a company. It was incorporated in January, January 2020. And I had co-founders who had not built a tech company before. They had in, been in other businesses, but not built a tech company apart from one. So I, I needed to have a a program that puts structure to the things that we're going to experience. And um, this was going to be my second time. And I believe that Founder Institute was going to provide that kind of structure and make it very easy for us to have the same language. And that was my initial intention for going through the program because I'd gone through an accelerator before. Now we get into the program and I realized that it was um, beyond my expectation. It not only did, not only did it provide structure, but it helped us to, you know, really, um, uh, uh, work our company in a way that could really um, scale and be attractive to investors. And primarily, um, the original idea was just to go there and provide structure and, and, and for my, my, my partners and I, and we got more than that. Awesome. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Nana. Uh, so let's, I'm gonna get right to the audience questions. I'm gonna prioritize your questions over uh, any that I sort of like to ask founders. So yeah, please don't be shy. Uh, the first question in here is from uh, uh, Gopala Kishran. Sorry, I probably really butchered your name there, but uh, asking, oh, we're a B2C travel app on mobile and planning to launch in July. They've been selected to join an FI cohort that starts in September. So kind of a delta there between sometime in July, September, two, three months, um, uh, and asking, would it be good to join um, given that they plan to already have an MVP by the time they launch uh, in July and, and traction during that time frame. So uh, yeah, it seems a couple of people sort of answered that you pivoted a lot or really reevaluated sort of your uh, value proposition during the three and a half month FI program. Um, would anybody like to kind of speak to this question first on feasibility of planning to launch in July and then starting a, pro a program that starts um, in September? I can, I can, I can go. Because uh, when when we joined, we already had an MVP. Um, we had something that we thought was market ready. Um, so I think it, it, the beauty of FI is that it works if you just have an idea, uh, or if you have an existing product or an MVP. Um, I think. Even the, the latter is probably, from my own personal experience, is 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 FI works a lot better when you have like something that you 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 have your assumptions, and you can test those assumptions and see if it will hold up in the real world, um, as opposed to just an idea. But you know, like I said, FI works whether you come with an idea or you have a a, a product that you think is ready for market so yeah i definitely think i uh, definitely recommend that you still attend the program even though you have uh, an mvp thanks michael uh hanan or, or nana do either of you want to kind of speak to this uh believing they're gonna have mvp ready but then a couple months before their program would start yeah i think uh, you are you can go join fi when you just have an idea but when you have an um, a thesis that you've tested to an extent, you have maybe even a set of co-founders, it's even better, it's even easier because as a CEO, you can really, you know, bring your team to speed and the things that you have to figure out are already kind of structured for you in the exercises you do. So by doing the exercises, you're literally building your company. So yes, it's great when you have an idea, when you even have an MVP better, when you have a team, excellent, because then you can all share the lessons and and, and benefit together. Of course, it's just going to be the founder or the CEO who's going to be in the program, but I believe that the knowledge you acquire should be translated to your team. So I would, I, I think wherever you are, FI makes it possible for you to join, but it's better when you've done some work before joining. It makes it more relevant and more insightful. I can say, um... I think you could change the perspective a bit because uh, we as founders think I've done this stage, for example, I have an idea, so it's great. Ideas changes. You have a, an MVP, you'll do it maybe twice. You have a product, you'll keep doing it and iterating. So it's not about um, a certain milestone that, that FI is not about you having, a, accomplishing a certain milestone. It's about a mindset. Building a startup is a game. It's just like a video game. The problem is we as founders, first time founders, we just don't know the rules of the game. So you keep working and working in an empty dark space where no one knows what you do and you don't know what you do. So when you join the program, regardless if you have an idea, an MVP or even a product, if you do not know the rules of the game, which starts with your mindset, you will never make it. So regardless of which stage you are, just join. The idea will change, the MVP will change, the product will change even after you graduate. And this is what we need to accept. We will fail multiple times and we will accept failure. And maybe this is what my, my, my biggest lesson is the amount of tools that I got in, in Founder Institute because you keep getting uh, each week, you'll get, get a rating on your pitch from one to five. And most probably I got the tools. Again, I'm also the queen of tools. <laughs> um, and previously I used to think of it as an offense, like, oh my God, they don't like me. They don't deserve this. <laughs> but reality is 
this needs to change. <laughs> this needs to grow and this needs to improve because we are working in a changing world and it's never personal to you. So if you get this mindset, you will fail more, but you will get up. This is the intake out of it. Yeah, I like that insight on, on founder mindset and um, definitely agree with what all three panelists said. I guess like uh, the thing that I would sort of uh, emphasize is uh, kind of what Michael said, I think, at the beginning and uh, touched on this, too. It's like it really helps. Um, it's participating in the FI program if you do already have some level of MVP because the program is not uh, pedagogical in the sense like it's not a classroom lecture where you just sit and passively absorb information. The curriculum, and if anybody wants to kind of dive into detail, the website to, to the, or the, the page on our website to check out is fi.co slash program where it shows you basically the different sprints that you work through across the core curriculum over that three and a half months. But yeah, as Michael emphasized, having some level of MVP, it just makes the real world kind of testing of all of those different sprints a lot more applicable than if you're still sort of in the idea stage and it's very um, theoretical. So yeah, that's kind of how I would uh, recap what uh, each of our panelists have, have said in turn. We've got a ton of audience questions coming in. Thank you, everybody. Keep them coming. I have um, a few uh, uh, panelist specific questions that I just want to get to really quick. Uh, and so the first one is from uh, Oza and it's for um, both Michael and Nana. Can you please share your experience starting a company um, in Nigeria or at least Michael, you said you're doing business in Nigeria, I believe, uh, and how you were able to raise um, pre-seed funding. So uh, Oza is asking specifically about um, starting a company in Africa. Um, uh, either of you wanna jump in, Michael or Nana and, and speak to that? Sure, I can, I can jump in. So, uh, the uniqueness for us was I'm, I live in Canada. I'm, I'm literally physically in Canada. Um, I founded a company here and the core, uh, the parent company is based out in Ontario. It's an Ontario-based company. We, we do have operations in Nigeria and, and Kenya right now. Um, and essentially, it, the, 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 there's a certain way you have to structure your company uh, and you, you have to get your company ready for funding. Um, and there's certain milestones that you will need to hit before you kind of like venture ready. Um, so in terms of difficulty, I mean, it's not very difficult as long as you have a certain level of product market fit uh, with what you, with the problem that you, that you have or the problem you're trying to solve with the right product that you're building. And once you have that, I think, you know, the, the way the world exactly as someone just put in there Delaware C Corps that's how a lot of Nigerian founders you know have basically set up their, their company they have the Nigerian local company and they have the Delaware C Corp as the parent company that now uh, has the Nigerian company as the subsidiary and then once you have that all set up and you have the product market fit getting in touch with investors becomes a lot easier and the thing about FI is that they kind of will help you with that and and uh, Hanan mentioned something about weekly uh, pitch, pitching every week. That it really really helps you to the point that even now I don't need a pitch deck. I can literally pitch my entire pitch without the deck because you do it so so often. So you have to get venture ready. Uh, you have to get make sure your company is set up correctly. Uh, Program like Founder Institute will give you a certain level of exposure. And then when you do have that product market fit, then you can now look at securing capital and then it's a lot easier process. Yeah. Nana. Yeah, go ahead, Nana. Yeah, so um, I'll break that, um, answer the question in two parts. First is the incorporation, which is uh, um, to incorporate in Nigeria, I would suggest you use a platform, uh, it's called Nostrad, or I'll send a link that makes it easy for you to just you know, put everything there, pay and then take care of the entire registration. Um, similarly in Kenya, it makes it very easy. First, getting the legal entity set up is the most critical thing, in my opinion, depending on the type of business you're going to operate. So after you've gotten that done, it's a very easy thing because there are companies that are doing that for you. The next really thing is operations. The next thing is your technology being available. And depending on what, where, where, how your technology is going to operate in these, those markets, if it's web, easy, you can do that from your servers. If it's USSD based because um, a lot of African or, or, um, or sub-Saharan African markets, um, um, USSD is a very effective channel of reaching your clients for certain types of services. 
when I say USSD, you dial a star number and a hash before you go. So don't, depending on what type of technology you're using, you, you also have to make that technology available in there. And technically, if you're going to have customers' data, you must make sure you're data compliant. Now, with these boxes tick, the legal and the technology available, then comes the operational part. Um, so my, this is my second company. My first company, we, look, we try partnering with a larger company to take care of operations, and we provide us a technology. I can say it didn't work, uh, it failed. Um, so in this, this time, we are actually going to run operations with Nigerians. So um, we've seen companies that have done it and worked. And basically, what that means is that you must have boots on the ground, depending on the type of business you're operating. And typically, I found in most of Saharan African markets, when there's a phase to put to the product for the initial phase, it helps in traction and building customer confidence. And then subsequently, um, you wouldn't need that because then the brand would have grown. So it's very key that you understand that those markets are, for example, Nigeria is the biggest uh, market in Africa. It surpassed South Africa, and, and it's a huge market. Lagos alone is literally the entire Ghana in one city. So Nigeria is a monster, and you need to really get Nigerians to run your business in Nigeria to succeed, and it's as simple as that. Um, I think that it's, it's a market anyone who wants to build a Pan-African company should be in. It's, it's a large market and it's a great opportunity. Um, I must also say that you would have to learn the ropes because it's a unique market. It, it doesn't come easy. Um, I can speak at other, other markets about Ghana, but since the market, the question was specifically to Nigeria, I would, I would end there. Awesome. Yeah, thank you both for those uh, those detailed thoughts. I, I think that, that the person will find that helpful. I uh, have a question uh, as well for Hanan, actually, too, since I uh, uh, asked both uh, uh, Michael and Nana a question in turn. So uh, one, this first question is um, from Seham and are asking, uh, uh, how did you study feasibility, basically? Um, what were your, your first steps? And a uh, very similar question as well, also for uh, Hanan, who phrases it. Uh, what was your experience in FI because you were pre-product, I guess, um, when you when you started? What were what were the insights? So yeah, just uh, want to speak to any or both of those questions, Hanan, about just yeah being kind of it's different, maybe from what we described, being earlier stage when joining and um, and how that affected uh, your journey through. The I, uh, I I always say about like when you go into the program, just trust it, trust the flow. It looks hard. Sometimes they have the weirdest questions ever. Like, why would they ask me this question? Why would they ask me about what I love, how I feel? It's weird. Just answer the questions. You will get to an assignment that asks you to do an MVP. Before that, you will be asked about feasibility. The beauty of the program is that it asks the right questions at the right time. So all you need to do is literally follow the assignments uh, um, and, and do them um, willingly. Don't do them because someone is, it's not the school part. It's not, it's not because someone is looking over and wants to see what you do. Do it because you want to do it and uh, you will get the answers. I remember for me, um, I was doing one of the assignments which asks you about your feasibility and part of your feasibility uh, in early stages is just assumptions that you throw in the air. Uh, and then I, I, I remember I had colleagues who were doing the same assignment and they just decided to throw any answer just to do the assignment uh, because it's easier. But what I really did is that I went and asked people. I got answers that I didn't like. <laughs> Uh, I had to accept them, ask new questions, and keep asking questions till I got not to the answer that I wanted, because obviously it was not the right assumption, to the answer that people wanted at that point. And this is where I started getting some feasibility. Uh, at a later stage, I was a bit insecure about okay, did I got, get the right answers or not? Because sometimes we ask the wrong questions as well. Or in, in, in the uh, way of we uh, be asking questions, we kind of let people know the answer. So we're feeding them the answer to hear it. Um, so I also noticed that I'm doing that. So I stopped doing that as well. And for me, because it was e-commerce, I simply was brave enough, <laughs> I'll call it brave, because it was scary for me to just put everything on Instagram. It's cheap, it's actually, it's, it's, it doesn't cost anything. 
And I started doing sponsored ads to different assumptions. So I did assume that people wanted to buy certain items with a certain, uh, and they wouldn't mind a certain profit margin that is good for me. And this is where I started changing my ads. So this time, for example, I, I put a certain cost and then and, and another one. Um, and I was not, because at first you would think, I don't want to do any mistakes. This is my name. No, just do all the mistakes. This is how you get feasibility by doing all these mistakes. And the, the beauty of the program again, is that it literally tells you to do these mistakes. <laughs> um, so this is literally how you get your feasibility. And actually, because I recently pivoted to B2B model, I'm doing the same mistakes again. <laughs> and now I'm doing it as a landing page because it's a different approach. Uh, but I'm doing it this way because I'm literally opening the assignments that I had, I'm reviewing them back and following the assignment again. It's funny, it's just a loop. The loop keeps going on again and again and again. You get better and it gets harder. So kind of the same amount of pressure. Yeah, that's super interesting that, yeah, you're uh, you know, having graduated, um, but so, you know, pivoting again and using this as uh, the, or the FI curriculum or program as like a framework to, yeah, work through each of those iterations in turn. Super, super interesting. Um, question here from Jayesh I want to ask next is, um, could you please uh, speak to the uh, initial capital? We've talked about raising capital, but the initial capital that you guys invested into your own startups and how long you were bootstrapped or how you bootstrapped um, along the way. Um, anybody want to take that question first? Yeah, I'll speak to that. So um, when we started a company, um, one of our uh, for co-founders, one of us financed with about fifteen thousand dollars for us to start operations, and uh, we we're able to pay back that, and also raise more capital, um, to operate. One of the strategies we adopted very early on was to, by the way, we started our company during the COVID season, so our overhead was pretty very low. So a lot of the founders, we were not, we were the original employees, and we were not taking salary. We just got money for our data and air time and to build our first MVP and validate the idea. So our strategy was to grow traction and then raise quickly. Um, we, right after FI1 went to fund, we were able to raise some money from um, some little money from investors to grow our uh, platform and our customer base. And uh, the last strategy we adopted was because we were in a space where there's also some grants available. We took advantage of grants to um, develop the, the technology, the markets, and that, that allowed us to make some mistakes and correct ourselves uh, with little cost to our equity. And, and, and that's one of the ways we're able to raise the, um, our traction from which we're able to raise the needed capital. I think um, other things that we did was to stick to really early on updating potential investors about our progress, what we're doing, and how we're, how we're performing, and it did help. I believe a template makes life easy. But finally, it was really to understand the markets within which you operate and understand where the, the capital will come from and putting structures internally to consistently pursue those markets or those channels where we could have capital to go. So that's how we started and that's how we, we raised capital. Thanks, Nana. Um, uh, Michael or, or Hanan, do either if you want to speak to kind of bootstrapping free free yeah, funding? Okay, I can go quickly. Um, so, yeah, I, I basically used up my entire life savings and credit and debt and everything, right? Um, you have to remember when you start, you have such a short window, especially if you're bootstrapping to be able to hit a certain level of traction where you either have enough traction where you can raise outside capital. Um, one thing that you're not going to, unless you are a second time founder, and even then, you know, if you're a second time founder and you had a successful previous exit, uh, you're still gonna be difficult just to raise capital on just an, an idea, 
right? So you're not going to just say, oh, I have this great idea, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be a billion dollar idea, blah, 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 whatever, right? I just raise money. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to start with something um, and hit a certain level of traction to be able to get to that point. So that's what I did. I, you know, leveraged every single resource I could, uh, which was very difficult, but I had to do, you know, it, it makes, it hones your senses because you know that, okay, I'm going all in um, and I have to make it work, right? And that gives you a certain level of razor sharp focus because you know you got to have to make, you, you have to make this work or else you run out of, of, of dry powder, you run out of, of capital. And then if you don't have anything to show for it, then that, that just sucks, right? Um, so in terms of bootstrapping, that's, that was, that's what I did. I think I, I think I started off with about 15,000 of my own money and then credit cards and so on, maxed out everything. Um, but, but luckily I was, by the time I got to the point where I basically ran empty, I had enough traction that I could now raise venture capital. So, so that's kind of like what you want to do. You have to be very precise about what you want to do, your milestones you want to achieve. Um, programs like FI will help you to kind of focus your attention on what is important and avoid all the noise and distractions. And once you achieve that certain level of traction, then, you know, the, the money is out there. You know, even, you know, they're saying the soft economy and, you know, the stock market and everything happening. I mean, there's still money out there. As, as looking that money out there is looking for good founders, good businesses. Um, once you create that, you know, visibility that you are the right founder in the right space at the right time, you'll be able to raise money for sure. Yeah, thanks so much for, for that answer, Michael. I want to keep moving, get get to some more questions here because I've got a ton. We're definitely not going to get to all of them, but keep asking them because uh, I'm making judgment calls as I, as I go and ask them. So uh, the next one I want to ask is from Natasha, uh, and she asks um, around mentors and advisors, sort of a two-part question. Can you share your experiences around the incorporation stage as well as um, specifically the advisor selection? Um, so for any of you, especially who brought on advisors in like a formal capacity after you had incorporated uh, anybody want to take that uh, question first around advisors? I can take it. Uh, regarding uh, mentors, I think this is the value proposition of Founder Institute, having the mentors, local, national, international mentors. Um, the quality of mentors matters so, because I, I think it became um, kind of a trend that someone says, I'm, a, I'm, I'm mentoring someone. For me in Jordan and in, in the MENA region, uh, there are lots of, of free programs running with mentors who are not really mentors because first of all, how could someone mentor you about building your own startup while they've never done that before? It's not a business, it's, it's different. If I am successful in a corporate level, that does not entitle me to give you any startup advice. So the type of mentors I used to see, because I, again, I had a business before and I had mentors before uh, and um, I kind of lost hope of mentors because at, at some point it becomes a waste of time. Someone telling you that they know more than you and that's not how mentoring goes. Um, I was shocked actually in Founder Institute because I found very successful people with four exits investments and and you would imagine that they would look down to you they were actually very humble uh they used to write notes about my pitch deck i was like oh <laughs> because i'm not used to that i'm used to people talking like i'm better than you and they don't do that they actually listen to you they write notes about you they write recommendations to you and um my main value proposition uh, is a try before you buy e-commerce website. And when I remember when I pitched a nice idea at the time, I did not know it's all about logistics anyway. And I knew it 
from uh, a mentor who was an alumni of Founder Institute as well. So this is the type of information you get from these mentors. I still follow up with them, by the way. Uh, even when they give you feedback, they give you honest feedback. They don't tell you, go shut it down, nor they tell you, you are the best person in the world because neither of these uh, advices are advices anyway. They tell you exactly what is the problem and where to move uh, forward, how to think. It's not a mentor's job to give you the answer, it's your job to find it. The mentor's job is to guide you with more questions, to let you think. Uh, again, the beauty of it is because at some point when you are raising funds, most likely you will raise funds from your region. These mentors also are from your region, so they know the market. So they would also give you advice that makes you fit in the market because you have to at some point. Um, and you will get a collection of local For mentors, um, national, because you want the bigger vision. Uh, what? Oh, oh, I think you're, you're good. I think you just froze for one second, but you came right back. Uh, actually, yeah, I love the way you uh, framed the, the mentors. I mean, I, I, uh, the mentorship through FI versus some other mentors, so more corporate space who you connected with prior. I think that uh, the way you explained it makes a lot of sense. And like a kind of truism is like mentors who are not that good of mentors tend to be people who tell you very specifically, you know, this is what you must do. This is the way you must do your next thing. Whereas the mentors who tend to be really good are much more like asking you questions and sort of having you like um, discover those sort of next steps for yourself or it's more of like a an entire a back and forth questioning process that brings those to light but I wanted to ask you one other question as a follow-up very quickly uh Hanan just because uh, it's relevant to what you were just saying so this question is from Saif and uh asking uh what will FI help uh this is a sort of a two-part thing but um already having a registered company um supposedly with revenue and customers already but will fi help um to access angel investors or vcs within the mena region and i wanted to yeah post that um to you because uh you're, you're definitely active in the region and talked about the mentor network so uh and, any thoughts on on that um i think because i recruit founders as well uh, <laughs> Uh, people always ask you, will FI or a certain entity help you uh, get funding? No one will. It's just you. And it's no one's job to get you investors. It's literally your job. However, uh, the job of the network of Founder Institute is to give you the right information, to know the right space uh, mm. with the right pitch deck, to go and talk to people. So if you want an intro to someone, they will definitely introduce you, but you need to know where you want to go so that anyone can help you go there. But if you don't know where you want to go and you just want to get an investment, I don't think anyone can help with that. Um, I have asked for multiple intros from um, mentors from my cohort and they did it happily, but then it's up to you. So it's up to you to know where you want to go and it's up to you to know how much money you want and why uh, and to present your startup. So the job of Founder Institute is to put you in the right place with the right people and then it's up to you. I, don't, I think it's everywhere. It's, just, it's not only in MENA. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, Founder Institute has certain post programs. Um, if you go to fi.co slash scale, you can see some of these programs that we run just for alumni, like these three of the Founder Institute core program. And one of those uh, post programs is called Funding Lab. That's the one that we run most often. And so it's structured quite similarly to the Founder Institute core accelerator, but it's just for um, founders who are uh, focused full-time on fundraising, already have some level of traction and team. Um, and so there are sort of prerequisites for it. But um, uh, the next question I wanna ask you to, to each panelist in turn is just what was the most challenging part um, for you uh, during the actual uh, FI program itself? Um, uh, Hanan, if you wanna to go first, uh, go in the, in the order. Uh, what was the most challenging uh, part for you um, during the program? It's just not quitting. I think, uh, and I keep having these let's quit thought, <laughs> thoughts every day because it's hard. Uh, but I guess the magic is when it's hard, just don't quit. <laughs> um, I think this is the hardest part for me. But, but sweet and, and definitely true. Um, how about for you, Michael? 
most challenging part of the program? Um, the most challenging part for me was the, the assignments, uh, the, the very thorough, um, and you have one week to complete them. And you also have to pitch every week. You have to record yourself pitching and you have to submit that pitch every week. So it, that was very difficult because the assignments were not like, you know, it's something you just type up. You actually have to do something. You have to complete them. And then you write, you type about them or, or, or you do a screenshot or whatever it is. And it, it's one of those things where it's, it was difficult and it's, it's by design. Uh, if I, I'll be honest with, 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 you know, with everyone here, I've, uh, you know, I, I, after FI, I, you know, we raised our pre-seed funds and we, I got into Techstars, uh, the Montreal program. FI, Founder Institute is more difficult than Techstars, way more difficult. Um, and it is purely by design be, because they're trying to simulate how difficult being a startup founder is. So they make it really difficult for you. People quit. I remember my cohort, we started at, at, at 80, a bunch of people quit. A bunch of people were told to, you know, come back next program because they just, they just couldn't keep up. And we started as at 80 something. We ended up, I think, 21 or 24 at the end, right? So a bunch of people quit. A bunch of people were told to come back. And what I've discovered is after Founder Institute is that being a founder, it's way more difficult than Founder Institute. So uh, Founder Institute prepares you to become a founder by making things difficult for you, but then actually running a company. I, I, I wake up at five in the morning and I have two teams, two sets of teams in, in you know, three different time zones in Kenya, in Nigeria, in, in, in Canada. I have to, you know, we, we're talking sales, product, business development, marketing, all that stuff I got to deal with every day, decisions, all this stuff I have to do every day. It's way more difficult than Founder Institute and Founder Institute makes that program difficult so that you can kind of have a sliver of understanding of what it's like to actually run a company and you, you're mentally prepared and you can go through the program and go, you know what, uh, this, is, uh, if, if this, is, if this is only 10% of what it's like to run a company, this may not be for me, right? I may, I may just go seek employment, you know, <laughs> have a, you know, probably better, you know, steady salary, uh, you know, two weeks vacation, et cetera. Like I'll give you an example. I've been running curriculum for three years straight. I haven't had any vacation or time off. It's, it's hard. Um, so that for, for me is the most difficult uh, part of the program. But like I said, it's difficult by design. It's difficult to make you see that this is this is not easy. This is hard. This is difficult. Like I said, three years of running curriculum straight and no vacation, no time off. I work every seven days a week. It's hard. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what I found difficult about the program for sure. You, you explain that so well, Michael. Like, uh, yeah, I, I love the, the way you framed it. Like when you say almost the exact same thing at FI, it's like with the program is hard because it, it's because running a startup is even harder. And so, yeah, as a simulation for the real world of a founder, that is absolutely the intent of why the program is challenging. And uh, yeah, couldn't have definitely said it, said it better. Uh, so great, great insight. Uh, don't want to skip you, Nana. What was uh, for you the most challenging part of the FI Core program? It's founding lab. I mean, I know founding lab is after founder um, institute, yeah. but um, if I, if founder institute had founding lab is super hard because then you need to run your company, grow your attraction, and raise funding. And I hope that for those who make it through the founder institute and go into founding lab, um, uh, they are able to step up their game because it's um michael did a good job at describing the difficulty but i also want to talk about um how founder institute help you to raise and hannah not talking about it i think that um founder institute really helps you to raise uh, and more of that help comes at the fund um, um, founding lab where you learn how to raise funding and it's a very critical program if you manage to get in you would be given the tools and the skills but you will not be given the money. You would have to go find the investments, but you'd be given the right tools and skills. And trust me, 
when I'd gone through it, I, 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 I was able to raise my, um, um, my first round and I still use those principles. And funny enough, the tools I've, I've, I've I, I built through that program, currently my whole cap table is managed on Founder Institute templates. That my funnel I used was the funnel I designed whilst I was, I was in Founding Lab and other entrepreneurs borrow it to, to, you know, to try and raise. So it, I think that for me is the most difficult part and yeah, that, that, that's how it helps you to fundraise. Great, great insight. Yeah, we have like 10 more minutes left, so I want to get to like um, two more questions, hopefully. So uh, this uh, question here is from Gukrit uh, asking, uh, do you have co-founders, so to, to each of you in turn, and if so, uh, how or where did you find them? Uh, asking, you know, is it true that you can't get funding as a solo founder? It's not 100% true, but uh, it's mostly true. Uh, and that is like a prerequisite for the program that Nana was just talking about. In order to join a funding lab, you do have to have some level of team uh, already in place. So uh, yeah, does anybody want to kind of speak to where you found your co-founders and, and where you were in the process when you did find them? Yeah, briefly. Yeah, my founders have been friends for a long time and we never thought about starting a business until we did a trip from uh, Ghana to Nigeria on bicycles. We saw an opportunity and we all had interest in solving it and had some skills that could, that could help each other. But because we only decided to find the, found the company together because we, we wanted to build a company that we were excited about each other before the product because you spend most of your time with people in your company so you must as well enjoy your company if you're going to do this long term. And I, I think one of the best decisions I made, this is my second company. And when there's no work, I just enjoy to talk, talking to them as friends and as human beings. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but in my case, um, I was just lucky to have my friends being my co-founders and it's been an exciting journey. That said, other founders or later stage found, um, co-founders who joined, we had no relationship, but they were good at what they did and, and they joined. I can follow up on what Nana said. I actually started with my best friend, but it did not work out, which is completely fine. We're still friends. We just can't work together because um, it just didn't work. We had different visions, different dreams, no clear goal. Uh, and that does not mean we don't like each other. It just means it's not working. So later on, I needed a co-founder. So I actually found him on LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, and he's great. So if you want something, you will find it on LinkedIn. Uh, and he lives in Tunisia. I'm in Jordan. I've never seen him um, face to face. We have been uh, in a, a long distance relationship. <laughs> However, it's working well. So, yeah. Very interesting, yeah, story. Love it. It's so different from from Nana as well. Not maybe your first co-founder when it was your friend, but this uh, you built a virtual first company during the pandemic. Yeah, met a co-founder through LinkedIn who you still not met face to face. Yes, yeah. So super interesting. Uh, how about how about for you, Michael? I believe you have uh, definitely a team. I know you have a team, but how about co-founders? Where do you find them? Yeah, so I'm going to go the other way where I am. A, I'm a solo founder. I founded curriculum myself. Where I have I have a founding team but there is no, I have no co-founder. Uh, so I would go back to when Nana said he uh, rode on a bicycle from Ghana to, to Nigeria. That's one heck of a bike ride. So, I mean, you know, good job there. But um, it, it, it just shows like, you know, just from the panel, you, you just see the different, you know, uh, diverse backgrounds of how we all founded our companies. Like I have no co-founder. I founded, I was a solo founder. I did found the Institute full-time and worked on the business full-time and, and that was hard. I recommend a co-founder if you can find a good one, but if you can't and you feel like, you know, it just means that a lot of the responsibility come, falls on you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm living testament that you can, you can kind of do it all. So yeah. Yeah, and building initial traction helps you, you know, should, Michael, if you wanted to, like, go out and find a co-founder, I think, like, once you start to have product market fit or, or, or get closer to it, yeah, at that point, if you're, like, a non-technical person, you're much more attractive to uh, bring on a technical co-founder if you can demonstrate, okay, this idea has some legs to it, basically, um, and so um, that's the way I would answer that. I want to answer just, like, a few more questions quickly myself um, before I get to, I guess, our final 
question, uh, just because we there's a lot that we didn't get to, but uh, Mohanad is asking, is language a problem in joining FI, so being not fluent in English? Um, Mohanad, no, a, a lot of the programs are not run in English. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, if you go to fi.co slash enrolling and look at um, you know what city or regional uh, cohort is closest to you, you might find a, a language or, or a native uh, to, to match you, a program that matches your native language. I don't know if any of you took a program that was not run in English, but um, at any rate, we definitely do have um, programs around the world that are that are not run in English. And if you're not sure, you can like apply to one and, and ask kind of at that phase um, to make sure that uh, the, the language uh, matches your requirements. Another question, just to knock another one out quickly, Adochi, uh, Udochi asks, um, do some founders uh, still work full time basically before joining the program? And the answer is yes. So Founder Institute is kind of unique in this respect as opposed to a Techstar seed stage accelerator. We position ourselves at the pre-seed stage and a lot of founders who do come in are still full time uh, at their, their full time job basically. And you know they, they have this idea that they've been toying around with. Maybe they've you know, built the, the landing page or something like that, but they wanna use Founder Institute, the curriculum as a, a pretty hardcore standard box to basically test their idea. But all of the programs, generally speaking, as long as you're taking a program that's like within your time zone, they're always run in the evening. And that's to um, facilitate, you know, being able to, to stick on with your full-time job while you're trying to decide if um, this startup is something that you want to focus on full-time um, in the future. Uh, so there, I got uh, answered at least two more questions, I guess. Um, but I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here and get to one final question and wrap up uh, before we get to to, to the top of the hour. So my, my final question in closing is just what tips would you give to, to somebody, to a prospective founder um, to be successful in the program? Uh, so uh, everybody can answer this question in turn, but just your kind of top level uh, takeaways uh, as an alumni, uh, what tips would you give somebody who's maybe been accepted and is looking forward to coming in in, in the coming weeks or months? Uh, Hanan, do you want to answer that question first? Um, I would say again just don't quit it's weird it's strange it's not comfortable because if you want to grow you will get out of your comfort zone building a startup means getting out of your comfort zone each time you get from idea to precede to seed you just don't know what you're doing you fake it till you make it <laughs> it's fine this is how all of us feel in all stages so just don't quit if you feel this way Perfect. How about you, Michael? Yeah. So I would just say show show up, work hard, and listen, um, it, because there's a lot of takeaways. There's a lot of experience in the cohort, uh, in not even the core, the, the mentors. Uh, you, you the a lot of the mentors are, are currently operators or former operators. They operate or businesses. These are not, you know, business executive types that went to business school. These are people actually done business, run businesses. So having that open-mindedness uh, to actually, you know, to show up, work your ass off and you listen to good advice, I think you will be successful. Awesome. Yeah. How about you, Nana? Two things. Let's talk more action and enjoy the experience. That's what you should do. Do more work, work less, and enjoy the experience. It's very important. You go through this experience once. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, we are very rapidly approaching the, the top of the hour here. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. I want to say thank you again to each of our three guests, Hanan, Michael, and Nana. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and sharing your thoughts with the prospective founders who are here on the call with us. Really appreciate yeah, all of your insights and, and feedback and answering these questions. And um, yeah, just for everybody who, who registered via the FI site, you will get a copy of this webinar replay if you joined us late or, or want to rewatch. Um, parts of our guest answers um, should land in your inbox within the next couple of days. Uh, yeah, and for everybody who joined us here live, uh, please keep healthy, uh, you know, stay in touch with us. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks, thanks everyone.